Hey everybody, so today we are going to have another quick take. This time we're going to be talking about the differences between ETL and ELT, and that is extract, transform, and load, which has been around for quite some time. It is the typical way that database pipelines are set up, or an ELT, which is sort of on the newer side because it is very much centered in cloud architecture and linked data. Check this one out up here if you didn't check that video out before on linked data. And extract, transform, and load is much more reliable. It is something that allows you to do a lot of compliance because you can understand what the data is that you're using. You have a way to basically track your path and where the data is and who's used it and so on and so forth. Um, it's also really helpful for smaller businesses that might not have the money to constantly be picking data up off of the web or in dynamic locations like Link Data offers and being able to crunch that data if you don't have the money to be able to do that. Um, ELT might not be for you. However, you shouldn't let that deter you because ELT, if you don't have a lot of data, the data processing power needed to get through all of that isn't actually that high. Maybe you don't want to retain and maintain and store all of that information. That said, storing information is a lot cheaper. Here's a great meme on that uh, than it used to be. So if you are using um, cost as your primary um, understanding of which one you're gonna go with, they actually are pretty comparable. The use cases around ELT, extract, load, and transform, is when you need to do something quick. You need to be able to grab data, tr transform the data as you need it. So as you can imagine, that's not great for runtime applications where you really need to have the data already figured out so that you can serve it up to your users. But if you're doing something that's more on the analytical side, or maybe you're doing some machine learning, maybe you're making a knowledge graph, uh, sometimes you don't necessarily need to have all the data at your fingertips at once. So with that, let's go look at that architecture. And I will be using AWS tools. And the reason I'm doing that is because I do think they are quite popular. They are the tool sets that I am the most familiar with. Uh, there are other ones out there, certainly. Uh, there's the Google Cloud, for instance, uh, Azure, which is from Microsoft. There's, there's quite a few other ways to build out pipelines. Okay, so what I'm going to be doing is talking about the extract piece. So right now, the data that I'm looking at here is Wikidata, which is in a REST API. I've got Science Today articles, which are web pages that I need to scrape. So the first thing Again, these are general architectural diagrams. You will have to make sure that you customize these for your own use case. Okay, so here I need to go and grab my crawler. Okay, so I'm gonna grab my crawler and I am going to put that as my first step. Now, the reason I'm not specifying which crawler, there are a lot of different types out there. Crawlers are essentially going out and, and scraping things from the web and crawling information. Very similar to what Google does to make its indexes. So let's stick that there. Now you need to have something that's watching those crawlers. If you have a pretty big uh, pipeline or a lot of events that are firing all at once here, I only have two data sets. So most likely I wouldn't need something to watch this, but let's say that I do because chances are you probably do. And so that would be a CloudWatch. You can set up CloudWatch with EC2. So EC2 is being able to grab a bunch of data and synthesize and do things with it. It's basically how you get that compute time. So I'm gonna grab that. Can make it a little smaller. Okay, so right now the crawler is picking things up. CloudWatch is watching it. And then when it finds something, it sucks it up. So that's a lot of that extract piece. So what happens after an event where maybe more information for a certain web page or a certain wiki data element has been updated. Maybe that's what my crawlers are, are looking for. Crawlers, by the way, can be a push or a pull. And that's what the CloudWatch is going to be looking for. If it's something that we are sending out, that's where you would wanna grab that information and you bring it back. Or maybe it's a push where you are actively getting 
information from let's say science today and then you have to update it as it comes in okay so now we have to take it through a few different steps to actually extract and load it up and so the way that you do that is with step functions and then to actually run the scripts and the things that you need to do to actually grab it and do something with it that is called lambda so let's go ahead and put those in so you'll notice that so far i haven't said anything is different because up to this point etl and elt are kind of the same so for the next part that's going to be the last part that is pretty similar and that's the lambda so those step functions are then going to feed things into the lambda function essentially just taking your script and making it productionized so that you don't have to constantly be looking at it and moving things it, it's basically the way to automate certain steps in your step functions this is where things get a little different so if i am doing an extract and transform application i would be using my lambda to send it to different transforms so again there are different transformers out there on the market some actually do a lot of the whole etl process for you Again, those are gonna be in the description below, but for now we're going to use glue. So in this case, AWS glue is going to be doing the transforms that I want and populate it into the databases that I have. So in order to do that, I have to use glue so that I can use certain transformers, whether it is parsing out the author or other pieces of information that you want to grab and normalize and set down into your data structure. So once you are done with the glue application, that's where you can make the decision whether to put this into Redshift, which is another AWS type of database, or if you wanna just put this down into uh, an S3 bucket. Okay, so Lambda and glue are kind of the two things that we are doing for transformation. So let's move those up a little bit. Now remember, Lambda is kind of universal to these two, so we're gonna keep that there. Now, once it's in glue, it's got to then load it to a database. So I'm going to grab MongoDB as my example. So this first flow that we've just created, that is taking us through the ETL process. Now, I am simplifying this extremely. So please just take it with a grain of salt. This is really just to talk about the differences between the two. We will have many more videos where we talk about architectures in depth. So ETL's benefits are that it is reliable, it is highly effective because a lot of people use it, there are a lot of tools in the market, a lot of different uh, architectures that you can copy or borrow from. If you are doing an ETL, it is quite complex. You, you really do have to understand very thoroughly what is your use case, what's the data that you're going to be using very early on, which does cost you time to market if you are shipping anything out. So some people opt for an ELT process, which is much quicker. It is a just in time, rather a just in case model, because these are things used for analysis or kinds of machine learning where you get to just throw the data down, see what you need to get and then run it. These are much more agile, but again, they come with with a cost. But again, they are not as reliable as ETL because you really are just laying the data down as is. So let's take a look and see what this looks like. Now, here's the difference. What's called a lake storage. And this is sort of where we're getting into more on the transform side. You do have to put data down somewhere in order to do something with it. Let's say that we, we process things and we stick it down without any normalization into Redshift. And let's say we have an EC2 instance that we are using to run and compute. And we're doing this on some SageMaker work. So if you are grabbing this information to connect things up in a semantic way, you would then want to store that somewhere with this ELT, where we maybe are going to be populating a property graph so that we can get those actionable insights somewhere where we can quickly query them. So let's put these into Neptune. Now, the interesting thing is because these are all components that you can mix and match, maybe after I put something down into Neptune, I wanna make another Redshift database for me to use with my ETL pipeline. So let us recap. And also remember, these are not mutually exclusive. 
again, there is a time and a place for everything that we do. And if you do have something that's got to be like quick and dirty and you don't necessarily have to worry about HIPAA, GDPR, or laying things down for repeat processes, then using an ELT might be the, the answer for that. If there is something that you just want a very quick analysis on something, it's going to cost you money to run it, of course, but you don't have to invest all that time in, in figuring out the whole boiling the ocean, so to speak, before you get to any answers. So that is my quick tick. Hope you enjoyed it, and I'll catch you next time.